From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi there. Welcome to the show. Hi there. Welcome to the show. So have you seen Karen Lewis on TV this week? Well, she did a rather electric appearance at the City Club on Monday where she made it clear that she would not be going around knocking on any doors for um, Rahm Emanuel and that the CTU would almost certainly not take up that option on the fourth year of their contract. So that means there's going to be a lot of union talk in the air during the mayoral election next January and February. Now, Lewis has been making the rounds of newsrooms and editorial boards, and she even made an appearance on Tuesday night at the hideout talking with Ben Jarovsky and Mick Dumkey. And among her points is that there really are ways to raise more revenue to fund the pensions than our government's, uh, you know, promised its public service employees. So we'll take up that and several other issues that she raised with our panel this week. But there's more education news this week also. The Ballyhooed Barack Obama High School that nobody would heard of until it was announced. The school that would take up four of the five acres of a park the community had been working on for years, planning. And then the startling number of teachers who are leaving CPS, some voluntary and some not. So Paul Biasco is joining us for the first time from DNA Info. Paul, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks so much Paul for having me. Paul is the guy who wrote that story about Obama High School. And Hal Dardick is back after a long uh, vacation from the show. I'm glad Hi. to have you back, Hal. City Hall reporter from the Chicago Tribune and Lorraine Forte back again from Catalyst Chicago. Thanks. Nice to have all three of you here. So um, should we begin with the uh, the great Karen Lewis media tour that, that we've uh, been watching this week? Uh, uh, I mean, she, ra she raised a lot of issues, but she also, you know, put something on the table. It wasn't just running around criticizing everything. She put some financial proposals on the table, and, and they have at least gotten people talking a little bit, right? Yeah, she's been, uh, well, to go back, uh, go back a bit to what you said about them not negotiate or not picking up their option mm -hmm. on last option, year option on their contract, they've kind of been saying that for a while, but yeah, yeah. what she floated this week was what I they're getting, been reporting that yeah, they, what she floated this week is, I guess they're calling it a LaSalle Street tax or uh, because that's where the board mm -hmm. uh, board of mercantile exchange and financial district are and uh, as i understand it's a transaction tax to raise money to you know fill the pension deficit mm -hmm. so not being a financial expert, it, yeah, other yeah. people here probably know more about it well, than I mean, me, it was, it but was, I, I, it, all I know is it's a financial transaction. It was fascinating to tax. hear at the City Club because a lot of the city fathers were in the room and they were not applauding. They were <laughs> sitting rather stony-faced as she was talking about how, you know, this could be 0.012% uh, of, uh, the, of the cost of a transaction mm -hmm. and, you know, it could raise a lot of money for the city. So how did it play at City Hall? Uh, well, I think it shows a lot about uh, Karen Lewis is political savvy uh -huh. and that she can stand up there and introduce something that's been talked about on the margins before by the unions yeah. and put the idea into play whereas yeah. before it was always summarily dismissed as mm -hmm. something that's mm -hmm. just not workable you got to go to the federal government because it's interstate commerce these right. these mm -hmm. uh, trades mm -hmm. and transactions and you got to change the law there and you got to go to the general assembly and change the law and then there's always the question and I think there's I'm not an expert on financial transactions, but these folks all trade by computer now, so mm -hmm. what's going to force them to stay in the city of Chicago right, if right. they go ahead and do this? Right. Like, we'll, we'll go somewhere else and yeah, do I mean, our trade. What, what, so, but, but Karen Lewis is able to get that in play and change the discussion and bring out the idea that, yeah, we need more revenue into this equation and not just cuts mm -hmm. on the pension benefits for the people that I represent. Mm -hmm. But she also talked about, and this is another really difficult sort of tax and the commuter tax, yeah, uh, yeah. which is mm -hmm. basically the city of Chicago uh, levying an income tax on the people that commute from the suburbs to work in the city. Mm -hmm. And you got to imagine that some businesses in defense of their employees or even their CEOs mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. might not want to do business in the city of Chicago. Another very difficult thing. But she's managed to change the subject. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. of course, you live in Barrington Hills, right? Because that's where Tribune employees are supposed to live. Right? Uh, right? Yeah, either that or Kenilworth. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so that's what it says. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think you make such a good point, Hal, that that she has the political gravitas to actually put this stuff on the table in a way that 
we don't see other people being able to do it. Now, of course, a lot of people immediately started shooting it down, but it, at least it's a debate again, which it which hasn't been for a long time. Well, hasn't it something like that been proposed more on a national level? Haven't I heard people it, talk about one way to raise revenue is to tax financial transactions I, I think especially in light of what caused the last mm -hmm. long right. and deep recession and yeah. uh, the, the deals that banks made and they said well why don't the, the people in that industry mm -hmm. you know yeah, help, help fund yeah. uh, the, yeah. the, our recovery and, mm -hmm. and, and our taxes that we all pay uh, to help bail them out mm -hmm. in the first place. We always right. hear the same the same response to almost any proposal for taxes though. The people affected will just get up and leave. 50% of Illinois wants to leave because they're so unhappy here so they want to move to Indiana or Wisconsin or something. And you know the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange within 24 hours would become the Elmhurst Mercantile Exchange and they wouldn't have to pay the tax or something like that. So, uh, you know, I, I just think that maybe it's time that that conversation goes at least two or three layers deeper and you really look at whether or not that's real, whether there really is an incentive to leave or maybe maybe there is some money that could be taken out of this. I don't know. Well, what is going to attract, you know, the Chicago Board of Trade to go to Elmhurst <laughs> and then call itself the Elmhurst Board of Trade? I mean, if really, they could save, If they could save $100,000 in taxes, maybe they'd well, do what's it. What's 100 I, I mean, I'm not saying it's a good idea or not because yeah. I'm not an expert in that, but yeah. what's $100,000 to the Chicago Board of Trade? It's right, like right. they probably spend that on toilet paper every yeah. year. Yeah. So. You have to ask the question about the political reality here. Who are the people right. that uh, fund campaigns of right. people like Mayor Rahm Emanuel, right. and right. how much does that play into mm -hmm. this equation? Right. So then, there's a lot of good questions. Right, and then the people that talk about leaving Illinois, I mean, are those really the people that are, as Hal said, funding Ra Rahm Emanuel's campaign? They're mm -hmm. happy here. They're mm -hmm. paying yeah. to have, for have him be mayor. You <laughs> they're know? making plenty of money. Yeah, they're yeah. making yeah doing yeah. good. Yeah. So. so, you know, the politics of this is is also very fascinating. We're all political animals and and uh, I thought it was really interesting. I was at the I was at the press briefing after the city club where Karen Lewis was standing at the podium mm -hmm. and just being peppered by all the the education reporters and some of the politics guys, uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. and 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 I thought it was really interesting that they kind of I have to say they kind of triangulated her. They kept throwing one question after another at her and sort of jacking up the stakes on each question until they finally got her to the point that she almost endorsed Tony Preckwinkle, which I don't think was her intention when she started. But, you know, the, the real thing that they were really driving at her about was, aren't you doing this as a way to inject politics into the election, the mayoral election, to which she said, you know, out of, almost out of frustration. It's like, hey, it's not my job to make it easy for Mayor Emanuel. It's my I mean, job and, to... And when, when has politics n not been part of union... Of course. ...negotiations right. or, right. you know, shenanigans or public stances? I mean, it's always been part of that. She, so. li she likes to say that she's not a politician. Yeah. But she, but she is. <laughs> she is. Yeah. I mean, she, you know, she may not be running for right. office, but right. she certainly has the instincts right. of a politician. She knows nothing about politics. Mm -hmm. you know. and well, I, I think, too, that you can't forget that her job right now as president of the CTU is to try to negotiate the best deal she can right. for pensions. Right for mm -hmm. her people. So by saying that we may not renew the contract mm -hmm. for that fourth year, by saying, well, there's these other ideas, Mr. Mayor, that you may not like, mm -hmm. all of those things uh, perhaps could encourage the mayor and his people to come to the table and make a little better deal mm -hmm. if they can get that to go away. Right, you know. right, right. <laughs> and as, as you know, Mark Brown said, I think, the other day in his column, it's like, no, she's, she's really probably not the least bit interested in running for mayor. She's interested in getting the best deal she can for her for her constituents, and if that means dangling this thing out there about her, you know, sort of playing with this, well, then that's fine because it's all part of the negotiating process. But it is fascinating to watch that um, we're seeing some of the public service unions now starting to really kick back on this this uh, austerity plan, mm -hmm. and who knows where it's going to go from there. But does it, for all three of you, does it actually affect 
Rahm Emanuel. Some of the people that I really respect and people we've had on the show here have, have been really shocking me lately, saying, hey, you know, Rahm Emanuel's kind of a, a vulnerable. He could really be a one-term mayor. And there's so many people, you know, that, that are kind of just totally disgusted with him. And I have to say that the, the reaction I have to that is to just kind of like slap my head and say, I, am I living in a completely different reality from you? The guy is invulnerable. Well, and I don't think he's invulnerable, but who's going to run against him? That's the question. I mean, he may be vulnerable if the right person were to run against him to sort of get all the people who, you know, say they don't like him, they don't want him again, they need a candidate. And, and, and uh, short of is that Barack person? Obama, who is that person? Well, I mean, people keep talking about Tony Preckwinkle, and mm -hmm. she said she's not going to run, and then, yeah. you know, whoever, but... I don't know who that person is. Somebody suggested the other day that uh, if Bruce Rahner loses, he could run for mayor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah. That, would be a, that would be a matchup. With uh, that there's a, a, a real amount of dissatisfaction in certain communities, in the African-American community, I believe, with this mayor, with the closing of the schools, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the fact that, okay, crime rates are down from last year, but they're really not a lot lower than they were two years ago. Mm -hmm. There's still a persistent right, right. and horrible crime problem in some neighborhoods that this mayor, in all fairness, inherited. But there's still that problem, and they'd like more to be done. So if there were a good, strong candidate, there is something to tap into. Mm -hmm. But like you say, mm -hmm. who is that person? Right, who person? is that candidate? I mean, you know, a lot of progressive people, union, you know, people who are union people or people who are, you know, progressive consider themselves progressive and don't like the mayor's policies, but who is that person who's going to mm -hmm. run against him? Mm -hmm. Of course, the other possibility is if Pat Quinn loses, he could run for mayor. <laughs> now, there would be an interesting <laughs> thought, wouldn't it? Quinn versus... Well, could anyway. start an anti-violence <laughs> program to <laughs> build his <laughs> name <laughs> recognition <laughs> in the city. <laughs> yeah, and they've already got the, they, they both agree on who should run the anti-violence exactly. program. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> inside joke, I guess. Let's get Paul into this conversation. Paul, you wrote about this. I, I, I just found it fascinating, again, as someone who briefly worked in City Hall. Mm. I love the fact that the just out of thin air came up with a fully hatched program for a major high school that nobody knew they were working on, announced it, and put it in the middle of a park that everybody thought they were designing that was going to be this big park. And when it all blew up, they sent somebody from City Hall to go out there and apologize and say, it was all my fault. It was, it was I an, did this, and I'm very <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I don't, it was an awkward <laughs> meeting just to see that happen. Awkward, you say? Yeah, she's just kind of standing there, and, you know, <laughs> a room heart. full, 100 people firing questions her way, and she said straight up, you know, I apologize. Uh -huh. We understand this is a communication gap. This was all created under, but uh, it's a $60 million school. Obviously, yeah. this must have took some planning. Yeah. Um, you know, I was actually working on a story on that exact area before this even came out um, on the lack of park space. You know, you're going to have, by some estimates, 10 to 20,000 new residents moving into this, I don't know, five block radius um, where the Cabrini We're talking Green. talking around like Division and Hall. Yeah, so it's the yeah. Cabrini Green redevelopment um, mm -hmm. area. So and there's a bunch of high rises going in that are market rate. They're not even involved. So this is an area where development's booming. And um, a lot of residents who have lived there for a long time say, you know, we already have a lack of parks, um, and we're, we have a problem with 20,000 more people are moving in. So that was the story I was working on. All of a sudden, we get the press release, hey, uh, new high school going in right in the middle of one of these parks that was going to take up, um, was going to be pretty much the main park for this whole area. So um, even the alderman said he didn't know until the day of alderman. It's astounding. Uh, I mean, even... Even by Chicago standards, this one's <coughs> just a real sort of a, you know, just kind of like raises both eyebrows. It's it's an amazing way of doing it. Did you did did anybody at City Hall have any idea there was going to be a high school plucked down there? No, it was news to us that they, you know, <laughs> the mayor likes to announce <laughs> things and, and have them, the information to himself mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. order to control it for it to co come from his office. In this case, putting uh, maybe a, a feeler out there, a trial balloon, might have helped uh, ease this mm -hmm. transition. Now, I, I think they're talking about another location now, possibly. Aren't the, they? Well, the way they said it. This, they like this spot, 
and it would almost the way they were talking about it was like maybe we'll move it around somewhere inside the park. But like they were really but it's on four this acres park. of the five acres. Four so acres of the five acres. Yeah. the five acres. And of much. those five acres, part of that's a pool. So yeah. we're not even and talking right about here. true park. Yeah. And Friends of the Parks came out against yeah. it. Who's against Friends of the Parks? Right. 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 I mean, it, and it's another instance of there are people that are dissatisfied with this mayor. And, you know. and then other you know people who live on the south side saying, why are you building another brand spanking new selective enrollment school on the north side? Well, it's it's less it's, than a mile. It's ten from, blocks so It's it's almost, less than it's a, mile a mile from Walter Payton <laughs> when you've already closed. 50 schools, and, and yeah, not that yeah, none of yeah. them should have been closed. Mm -hmm. There were schools that were not utilized mm -hmm. well that probably could have been, you know, legitimately closed. But, you know, not long ago, the city said we're moving the city's only fine arts high school, which was in Bronzeville, we're moving that mm -hmm. to the north side. Mm -hmm. And that got a lot of parents mm -hmm. of, ki you mm -hmm. know, south side kids angry. And the thing that pops into my head is, okay, if so many people want to leave Illinois, Chicago's losing population. Who's making these projections? Is there going to be 20,000 more families, people moving in this area and that they're going to have kids, mm -hmm. you know, to, to mm -hmm. for this high school mm -hmm. to justify it? I mean, CPS has been losing enrollment, well, so not gaining it. So, and arguably you could gain more if you had more, you know, Selective enrollment schools, but I think but still. I think that you uh, it, it, an argument could be made that the, the what the market is still demanding of CPS is these kind of high mm -hmm. end selective enrollment schools, yeah, like where market, there are already like empty rent. buildings which you you could renovate at less right. than sixty million to mm -hmm. accommodate that. Yeah, yeah. Well, th this school, I mean, people aren't upset that a school is coming in. It's the park situation. Um, it's almost, they're looking at this as kind of an anchor for this whole redevelopment. The CHA, you know, a lot of this is replacement housing mm -hmm. for, for, for what Green was Green. taken down. So mm -hmm. a lot of people are going to be coming back to that area. And although it's selective enrollment, 30% is going to be neighborhood mm -hmm. um, students. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you want people to move into all this new housing and you want it to be mixed mm -hmm. income, you say, hey, we have one of the one of the best schools in the city right here for you, and you're guaranteed a spot. Yeah. So I think that's part of the reason why um, they're looking at this school as kind of a magnet to bring people in. Of course, in. I don't know the the whole story on this, but isn't that what happened with Walter Payton? Wasn't Walter Payton supposed to do the same thing, and then after a year, they just stopped doing it? Or yeah, ran? that that was something uh, I thought was extremely interesting that came from that meeting I was at. Um, Alderman Burnett, you know, the mayor came to him last year when they said we wanted put an addition on Walter Payton. I think they're doubling it in size, mm -hmm. and they, they said we want TIF funds to do it. And he said, um, you know, when we opened Walter Payton the first year, we were supposed to have that community element, and uh, the next year they took it away. Mm -hmm. So, and that's when the mayor supposedly said to him, hey, we're going to get you another selective enrollment in your ward. Um, he didn't know when it was going to come, and then it did <laughs> end up coming. So. There, there is a, a goal and a desire at City Hall to prevent middle class folks who have mm -hmm. children from leaving right. the city. Right. Mm -hmm. And I got to believe this somehow, pl well, well, I think it, it totally plays into it. Mm -hmm. And I, I had another instance of this in my beat at Lincoln Park. Um, the addition to Lincoln Elementary last year announced um, there was other schools, um, CPS wide, that had greater overcrowding issues, but mm -hmm. the mayor and the aldermen were looking at this school as one that's bringing in some middle class families and they want them to stay. So they said, you know, well, we have this elementary school for you. They're working on some programs at Lincoln mm -hmm. Park High School as well. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. similar story. So, um, well, and, and also there's this, this other whole sort of side story that we don't need to get bogged down in, but the old Metro North High School that was only open from, I believe, 79 to 2000, something like that. Um, and that building is still standing. It's been empty for whatever it's been, 15 years. Mm -hmm. I think fire department and police use it for training and various other things. But I mean, there is a there is a high school, at least the core of a high school building about two blocks away from where they're planning this. And you would think that some creative planning could be done and maybe for less than $60 million, they could revive that building. But 
it's been sold to the CHA and it's going to be used for how? Uh, what's the deal with that? So it was uh, part of a land swap, went from CPS to the CHA recently within this year. I think it was within in, this year. I think it was in February. Um, and the master plan of this Cabrini Green redevelopment, which also came out around February, that school's supposed to be knocked down and put in some mixed um, use housing, mm -hmm. like seven story mm -hmm. condos and you know storefronts. Um, mm -hmm. There's also a field attached that's going to be right now. It's, it's privatized. Mm -hmm. You know they lease it out to sports teams, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but that's going to be like the new neighborhood park, and I mean it's pretty small over there. But mm -hmm. so. Partly what I'm hearing is that the city is saying, no, we couldn't possibly put Barack Obama over there because that's in a different planning process right. and we don't control it. But of course, as we know, the planning process is the mayor calls a bunch of people into his office and they make a decision and bam, it's done. So you would think they could bam that instead. But well, maybe that's not maybe that's not the way it's going to go. So one of the problems that we have in Illinois, Hal, and, and here in Chicago is that our neighborhoods aren't recovering enough. So we have a neighborhood recovery initiative that, that our governor created right around the election time yeah, last yeah. year. Did it recover any neighborhoods? Yeah, right, right before his, the first time you know, he was to run for governor as governor after he'd replaced uh, Blagojevich. Yeah. Uh, he, in, in it's, he's obviously in a close election. And in or, in, so it just happens, he says, that he was trying to address the spiking violence that was going on mm -hmm. in the city's south and west sides at that time. And so he forms this neighborhood recovery initiative, throws extra millions of dollars into this effort to fund programs that, you know, provide uh, more constructive programs for kids, counseling, uh, thing, programs that try to uh, tamp down the violence in the city. Uh, but it, it, the Republicans, right from the start, say this is just part of your reelection effort. You're going to start giving money to all these neighborhood groups, and it's going to help you get out the vote because they're going to be energized and they're going to go out and work for you in exchange for getting this money and sort of greasing the wheels around here. So that was the allegation. There was a report from the Auditor General of the state of Illinois that basically said the problem was terribly monitored, and you know the aldermen were just sort of allowed to decide on their own who got the money. There was no constructive way to determine that. And it was badly monitored, and money went to things that it shouldn't have gone to. Uh, the Sun Times has done some interesting reporting on this, uh, in terms of money going to the husband of uh, Cook County Circuit Court Clerk uh, Dorothy Brown. His name is Benton Cook, and and whether he, there's questions being raised about his uh, his qualifications to do this, and whether he got it because he's Dorothy Brown's husband or not, they of course deny that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of questions about this program and whether it was indeed an effort to tamp down the violence in the city that was going on, or whether it was a, a classical political way to sort of uh, Illinois style right, to right. grease the wheels right, right. And, and get out the vote, and the governor ends up winning by you know, a few tens of thousands of votes, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing could have made mm -hmm. the difference. Mm -hmm. and so it's never happened before. <laughs> 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 and not to, not to yeah, excuse yeah. it, right, I mean, right, these, right. you know, it is tax money, and it does need to be monitored I properly, know. but... I it, say pretty know. often on this show that the only advantage I know of, of of entering advanced age is that you've seen all this right. before. <laughs> well, well, and what's yeah. different about this a little bit? That's than, the than question. Somebody, yeah, what is, is, it? is there, there's uh, the Cook County State's Attorney Anita Alvarez has called uh, people to testify. Uh, you know, she's asked for documents, not called people to testify. As far as we know, she may have. To, you know, before a grand jury that's looking into some of this funding, uh, clearly the part that went to Benton Cook because Dorothy Brown received a mm -hmm. subpoena mm -hmm. in this case. And uh, the the uh, central Illinois jurisdiction uh, of the uh, the uh, attorney general, the U.S. attorney general, has also uh, issued subpoenas for the documents of the overall program. So there are people that look for criminal misbehavior that are looking into this, and it comes at a time when the November election yeah, is yeah. approaching. And what did Governor Quinn have going for him? All these years, you know, in light of you know Rod Blagojevich being in prison and George Ryan and everything else that that, that m made him at least even if he wasn't the most effective person in the world, you know, curry favor with people. It's that he was mm -hmm. Mr. Clean, clean. Yeah. Yeah. and he didn't engage in this yeah. sort of stuff. He's a populist, clean yeah. governor. Well, can 
Bruce Rauner's jumped all over this. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, he started a hotline yeah. to report yeah. corruption <laughs> on, on Governor Cuomo, which is, you know, obviously yeah. just an election sort of gimmick, yeah. but it, you know, it, it's something for him to jump all over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Lorraine, you guys did a really good couple of stories recently mm -hmm. about the the incredibly high turnover rate of teachers at CPS. I mean, I know the turn, uh, turnover rate is high everywhere. Yeah. It's not necessarily stunningly higher at CPS, but the effect is really dramatic. Well, it's it's costly for one thing. I mean, the, the um, uh, turnover rate here is about 18% a year, and nationally it's about 15%, so it's not dramatically different. Um, but it is very costly. I mean, it, we had a, a national group that estimates that it, you know, costs like, you know, eighteen thousand dollars or some per person to replace people well, that move, you know, yeah. to recruit and bring in new people and train people, and that adds up to about seventy-one million a year mm -hmm. just to replace people. And the interesting thing about it to me is that these uh, turnaround schools are called where they mm -hmm. go in and fire everybody and hire new teachers most of them you know brand new the turnover is highest there I mean even the hand-picked new teachers mm. that they bring in oh, by the third year the vast majority of them are gone why is that well, you know we talked to Sarah Carp who did the story talked to a, a number of former uh, AUSL it's called teachers and they just say the pressure to raise test scores very quickly mm -hmm. turnaround schools are in the toughest neighborhoods these are people who are right out of college don't have any experience you know living in Inglewood mm -hmm. or you know mm -hmm. the west side or something and it's too much pressure for these young kids too quickly mm -hmm. They can't get the kind of results that are wanted that quick. So they're like, you know what, we're gone. So here, here they're brought into a school that has been historically we, underperforming and for all kinds of reasons that right. we could spend two hours, two hours discussing. Long. And then suddenly AUSL is brought in. They bring in young, inexperienced people, and they for say, the most fix part, this. Yeah, and, and <laughs> fix it. And you know, three years later, most of them are gone. And for the most part, the problems are not fixed. Mm -hmm. So that's the short version of are that you, story. Is, do you know if there is the is the same thing happening at the charters? Are there are there turnovers? Um, turno you know, we looked at that a few years ago, and turnover is higher in charter schools or at the time it was mm -hmm. i mean most of the people in charter schools are younger newer yeah, yeah. teachers and yeah. they aren't automatically part of a union don't have protections mm -hmm. and you're we're seeing more charter schools become unionized yeah, because yeah. of you know the working yeah. conditions you know somewhat the pay but the working conditions and support for teachers is not not there yeah, so yeah. All right, that and everything else, we'll just have to keep on. We'll keep following it, right? We will. <laughs> All right, okay. All right, well, you've been watching Chicago Newsroom, and I want to thank Hal from, for coming over here, all the way over here from City Hall today. Thanks very much, Hal, from the Chicago Tribune, the August Chicago Tribune. And, of course, Paul Biasco joining us for the first time. I hope you'll be back again many times, Paul, from Hopefully DNA so. Info. And Lorraine Forte, again, same thing. Glad to have you back again, Lorraine. See you real soon, I hope. Uh, you've been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. You can watch us any old time right here on Can TV, but you can also find us right here on... Uh, YouTube by and you can watch the show anytime you want or you can subscribe on iTunes listen to our podcast there are so many ways to enjoy Chicago Newsroom and I hope you come back next week because whether you like it or not we'll be right back with another show on something else and we'll tell you what that is next week I'm Ken Davis thanks for watching see you next week we didn't...